welcome friends to this uh, one day workshop on the creative power of a sound current i am very glad to be here again in long island new york with some old friends some new ones some friends i i believe have come to a workshop for the first time will you raise your hands who are coming to this workshop for the first time thank you you are most welcome uh, i i presume you were here last evening at the lecture is there anybody here who had who has not seen me before and not come to the lecture last evening okay thank you i welcome you to uh, to this workshop uh, you will be able to follow what we are talking about as we go along but some others who came earlier have some background of the subject i speak on <clears throat> how many of you do meditation of some kind please raise your hands thank you how many of you have never done any meditation only one dan okay okay <laughs> uh how many of you have a have a master a guru who gives guidance thank you how many of you have no guru thank you how many of you don't believe there should be a guru thank you how many of you believe that the guru is inside us thank you how many of you have a mantra a a word to use a word or a group of words or verses to use for repetition as part of the sadhana or meditation thank you how many of you have no no uh, mantra thank you how many of you are against mantras thank you minority of one <laughs> but but i respect i respect that by putting these questions i give the image that i am more democratic than i really am <laughs> uh, today's workshop is going to be partly sharing of information and partly experiential you would like to experience what it means to go within oneself and that experiential part is where some of these aids some of these uh, te uh, techniques and devices like mantras meditation these can be used as devices to find ourselves and they were designed not to set up cults or religious groups they were designed to be of assistance to us in discovering ourselves as time went on we forgot about ourselves and only looked at the rituals and thought the ritual was the end the ritual was never the end the ritual was the means to discover the end which was oneself the true self uh, during the course of this workshop we'll uh, look into some of these devices and methods that have been used the truth i want to share with you in brief is that the reality is within us the true knowledge is inside us our own immortal self called the soul is inside us and the creator of that soul and the creator of all the universe and the creator of all creation is also inside us that the soul inside us is a seeker by nature and constantly seeks constantly seeks its own reality and what it seeks is the creator the totality god who is also inside us so both the seeker and the sought are inside and this drama of seeking for the truth is a drama that takes place only inside any attempt to shift this show this seeking this drama outside takes us away from the reality therefore all these pilgrimages outside all bathing in holy waters all rituals and ceremonies we perform outside all running here and there that we do do not take us to reality sometimes these external rituals and ceremonies can strike a spark in us inspire us to look inwards sometimes these external symbols like temples and churches 
and houses of God by their shape and activity and the sounds we put in them can inspire us to look into the real temple and the real church, which is our human body. But mostly, they draw us to themselves and keep us outside and do not let us go anywhere near reality. Therefore, if one is seriously interested in seeking the truth and reality, one should go within the only real effective church or temple, which is the human body. The trouble is, we do not know what is inside the human body. Doctors, students of anatomy, they cut up the bodies and they see all the bones and the flesh and the muscle and the tissues and other cells and they can't find any truth. They can't find anything different in the body. Moreover, when there is no life in the body, the body decays, decomposes, degenerates like any other matter and finishes and there is nothing left. The organic matter in the body decomposes so fast, it's very difficult to hold on to it. The 12 biochemical salts which survive also vanish after a period of time. Nothing is left of the physical body. How can this body then be the house of something immortal? How can this be the house of God? How can this be the house of the soul of an immortal spirit? This is such a commonplace notion in our head that the body is temporary that we do not really understand what is meant by God and soul being inside this body. What is meant by the creator being inside the body and the soul being inside the body is that while the body is alive, that spirit of consciousness appears to be operating from inside the body. That while the body is alive, we can use this body to look outside of the body and see the world, the creation. While this body is alive, we can close our eyes and in this head think a thought. That while this body is alive, we can seek. That while the body is alive and conscious, this life and consciousness is what makes the body the temple of the living God. A dead body is not a temple. Only a living body is the temple of God. Therefore, the temple of God is not associated with matter. It is associated with life that vests in a body. The life that makes the body alive, that makes the body a temple. Therefore, when we say, go within yourself, we start by saying, go within your body. But actually, we are saying, go within the life principle that is making the body alive. When we say go within yourself, we are really saying go within your conscious self. Go within yourself that is aware that you are a self. And that happens to be located in such a way at this time, it looks like it is operating in the body. Therefore, the body becomes a temple of God. So only a living, conscious, awakened body is the body which can be called the temple of God. A sleeping body is not a temple of God. An unconscious body is not a temple of God. Only a wakeful state in the human body makes it a temple of God. So while we are in the wakeful state, we should find out where is God? Where are we? Who are we? What is the self? It is in the wakeful state we can find this. And I am bringing this to your notice specifically in relation to some exercises people have done <clears throat> which puts the body to sleep. As if by putting the body to sleep, we make it a more effective instrument of seeking of the truth. We do not. If we are already awake and we want to reach a higher state of wakefulness, how can we go to a lower state of dreaming or sleeping and then say we wake up again? When I was a student at, not very far from here in Massachusetts, at Harvard University, in that year, 62, 63, Two professors who have now become well known, Richard Alpert and Timothy Leary, were experimenting with consciousness. And they were using Mexican mushrooms. And they were using the derivatives from the mushrooms prepared by a lab in Switzerland. 
and they were using those acids and using those chemicals in order to discover the chemistry of consciousness. And they thought that just by kicking in new experiences, they were able to discover reality. They were greatly mistaken. They kicked in new experiences, experiences which many of the old sadhus had tried for thousands of years in the East. And they found that those new experiences, just because they were new in relation to the normal sensory experiences of the physical body, they thought they constituted reality. No, they constituted different experience, not reality. The fact you can have a novel or a new experience does not lead you anywhere near reality. It is just like saying, if you have a wonderful dream, you've gone into reality. Of course not. You, dream, you have dreamt when you wake up, you feel more awake, you are willing to share with real people the dream that you had. I have never seen a person saying, I had such a beautiful dream and I met five friends there. I had never seen them before. Now I am going to tell them when I go to sleep again about the nice conversation I had with you. Because when you wake up, you discover the unreality of the dream. You never go back into a dream to tell your friends there what you saw in the wakeful state. The wakeful state gives a greater feeling of reality than the dream state. So even though the dream may be beautiful, the experience through drugs, experience through yogic exercises, the experience through going through various chakras may be great and beautiful. It does not take you towards reality. Reality is only possible if you are able to awaken more than you are awake now. How can there be a higher reality which makes you go into a trance, into a sleep-like state? Therefore, all these practices which yogis have done for a long time, which so many other experts have done for a long time to understand the nature of energy in the body, to understand how the body energy flows in circuits, and to understand which of the centers operates what energy level, and to go and have strange experiences in all these six chakras below the eyes. Incidentally, I am not criticizing them for what they are doing. They are doing a great job in understanding these centers. I have done it with them in order to find out what they were doing. And I am telling you from my experience, not their experience, about which I do not know much, that when you go into these six centers below, you can have amazing experiences of energy. But it does not tell you what is reality. It gives you no information what is the soul. It gives you no information what is immortal and operating in this body. Therefore, in this workshop, when you come here, and I want to share with you something, I want to share something that is true, that is real. What is true and real? True and real is what does not change, which is permanent. If it is lasting only for a little time, it could not be true and real. Only that can be real, that can be true, which is permanent and never changes. When we look around ourselves to find out if there is something that is so real as never to change, we can't find any real specimens of that kind of thing or being or nature or experience. We look at all the things and we find they all change. We change, our body changes. We are born, we grow up, we die. Everything else that we see changes with years, with time. The whole world changes, the cosmos changes, the planetary system changes. What is true here? What is real? The whole of life changes. Every object that we can see in this life changes. Our experience changes, our mood change. Our anger changes. Is there something permanent? When we look at things carefully, we find everything we can look at, everything we can experience, every kind of experience we have is changing. Therefore, it cannot be real. In terms of an absolute definition of reality and truth, none of this can be real. Whatever we see is not real. Therefore, it is not worth worshipping, not worth looking after, not worth getting inspiration from. It is not real. Now, if you watch closely what I am saying, you will notice I am saying if you look at things, if you watch things, if you experience things, they are all unreal. What about the experiencer of these things? What about the one who is looking at them? What about consciousness per se that observes change? The consciousness that observes change continues to observe. 
in an unchanged way. The consciousness that lives through life continues to live in an unchanged way. The self never changes and everything else changes. It is the conscious self that alone does not change in this whole setup. And therefore, if there is something real and something worth worshipping, something worth looking into, it is the consciousness of the self within ourselves. That is how the perfect mystic adepts found out that the truth lies within and not outside because everything outside changes and is not worth giving too much attention in the discovery of truth. Now, when we want to turn to our, uh, towards our own self to find the truth, we have a very big problem. The problem is we have, in the course of years, tied ourselves with several ropes, several strings to things outside. And we have tied ourselves, knotted ourselves up. Then we close our eyes and want to think, even for a few moments, what is inside? A thought comes and says, what about your work? Did you send that letter out? We tied ourselves up there. We want to sit in the head and say, who am I? And another voice says, but you forgot about the child who was there. We try to sit here and our children, our friends, our families, our work, our job, our disappointments, our chores, they pull us out all the time. And they pull us out in such a way as if we are tied up with them. These attachments that we have created for ourselves that keep us outside, don't let us sit inside our own self for a few seconds to watch who we are. So we have grown to a stage with attachments when we cannot come back. And as days pass, we use another device called desire. And with desire, we create more attachments. We desire things that we can see with our senses and therefore we go further out. There is the story of a king who lived in his royal palace and he had a beautiful princess and she lived with the king in the royal palace enjoying all the luxuries of the heavenly palace that was her father's. And the father hoped one day she will marry another prince and the princess will one day reign in another place in a palace and will lead the royal life. The princess, unfortunately, for the father particularly and for herself to some extent, instead of finding a prince to fall in love with, found a sudra, a, a low caste. In India, we have four castes. Now we have a casteless society, but for centuries we had four castes. The Brahmins were the top, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas and the Shudras. The Shudras were the lowest caste who just sca scavenged the roads and the streets and cleaned the potties. Of course, there were no potties in those times in the uh, toilets of the homes. But they were the lowest caste of people. And this princess, instead of falling in love with a prince and leading a royal life, falls in love with a Shudra and is dragged to the streets with the Shudra, leaves a royal life. But if that were so, and that was the end of her story, would not be so bad. One could say, at least she found the love of a man. And she gave up the riches of her palace. But that was not the end of the story. The man she fell in love with did not love her in turn. He loved other women in the street. Prostitutes, women of the street. And to make things worse, he did not love one of them. He loved two, three, four, five of them. So each one would dra draw him out. One would pull him, come along. And then by the time he got some time to go back to the princess, another would call him, come along. And he, this was the life of the princess with that man and his five prostitutes who drew him all the time. This is not the story of a king. This is our story. The king is our creator. The soul is the princess coming from heaven, used to living a heavenly life. And instead of finding a soul mate and living in a mansion in heaven and enjoying the heavenly beauties and continuous joy and bliss, this soul falls in love with the mind. The mind is the sudra. And the mind 
if it loved the soul back in turn would have given some happiness the mind in turn runs after the senses not one of them five of them the eyes open and see and draws the attention and takes it there the ears listen to music and takes it there all the five senses drag this mind out into different activities and desires and attachments and the poor soul the princess is in suffering it's our story it just put into the form of that table this princess is in such a state it is being dragged by the mind wherever the mind wants to take us it is the mind through desire that is creating all these attachments for us so when we want to meditate upon ourselves and go within we find all these attachments coming in our way they were created by the senses and the mind in the first place and as days progress and we set apart 15 minutes for meditation and 23 hours and 45 minutes for the activity of the mind we add on to these attachments and do not reduce them there's such an imbalanced life that we are leading even those who try meditation they have a harder and harder time every day people have told me they have been meditating for 45 years 50 years and it's becoming as hard as it could be nothing has happened because they given some time to meditation and all the rest of the time to developing obstruction and road blocks to successful meditation how could they see the spirit within so in order to correct this imbalance we have to have a way of life in which we change our priorities and we change our priorities to a spiritual life in which the spirit our own conscious self becomes the highest priority and the mind and its mental games and its desires and its tricks upon us to go after the senses should be given a lower priority the mind should be used like a computer which it is to carry out what the soul wills not that the soul should always look up to the mind what to do these mantras i talked to you earlier are a device to control the situation they should not be taken as something more than a device to start with if you have more experience with them certainly they mean a lot more but otherwise they are very useful the repetition of words is useful to keep the mind busy in those words like i have all always shared that story with you i'll share for the benefit of a few people who have come for the first time the rest please have patience and forbear with me the story of aladdin aladdin and the wonderful lamp you all recall that aladdin the little boy found a lamp when he rubbed the lamp a genie appeared a big genie appeared and the genie said i am your slave command what i shall do for you aladdin was so frightened by seeing a big genie he did not know what to say so he told the genie go and make a big house and when it is finished then come back to me he thought that would keep the genie busy for quite a while and meanwhile aladdin will be free from this monster within 5 minutes the genie was back the house is ready command what i shall do next seeing such an efficient genie aladdin gave him a bigger order make a bridge to span all the seas and then come back in 5 minutes the genie was back the bridge is ready tell me what else i should do for you very soon aladdin was out of all commands the genie was too efficient for him so he said genie do what you like the moment he said that the genie said come on now i'm going to do this and took aladdin along in the course of time the genie was giving instructions and aladdin was following them the genie became the master and the master who was being addressed as a master became the slave and followed the genie aladdin's life became horrible at this stage a friend of aladdin who knew better in this subject in this area than aladdin did he found aladdin and said look aladdin you used to be a very happy go lucky fellow you used to be so joyful and high spirited what's happened to you you look so sad and your face is so drawn and aladdin said it's a strange happening it tragic irony has taken place in my life that i found a lamp and i rubbed it and found a genie 
the genie claims to be my slave, but he's so quick and so efficient that instead of my giving him orders, he now lets me know what I have to do and I'm, I've become a slave myself. The friend said, that is no big problem. I'll give you a solution. Now, when the genie tells you what to do, you give him an order. Say, genie, bring a large wooden pole from the forest. And when the genie brings that big wooden pole, tell the genie, dig it in the center of this room. When the genie has dug the pole in the center of the room, says, what next, master? Say, genie, climb up and down this pole till I give you the next command. <laughs> Keep the genie busy on the pole. When you need something to be done, tell the genie, get off the pole, do this. As soon as he has finished this and says, what next, say, up and down on the pole. This is a suggestion for us. If we have really found a mind which was so efficient, so restless, so strong, that instead of the soul, our own consciousness telling the mind what to do, the mind through the thought process is now giving instructions to us and telling us what to do and getting us attached to so many things and creating more roadblocks for us. Why can't we put this genie of a mind on a little pole inside behind our eyes and take this mantra, the words of repetition, as a means to keep the genie on the pole? When the mind is working for us, let the mind work. When it is free, tell the mind, go back to that, repeat the words up and down, up and down. When you need to use the mind again, use it. When the mind has done its job and is becoming a devil's workshop again, being idle, put it back on that little pole inside, on the pole of repetition of the mantra. Up and down, up and down, till you need the mind again. These are devices to take care of a mind that has gone so wild, that takes us to different distractions and attachments and desires and interferes with the process of our going within and looking at ourselves. If somebody doesn't have a mantra, one can coin one. Just repeat any words. But if you repeat words which have a meaning of something outside, your mind will go there. So it cannot be any words. It should be any words making no sense. No sense in relation to anything outside of yourself. For example, I was sitting here when Marge came about lunch and I asked for pizza. Because I know I have always, from the first day I came to this country, loved G. Old Shaky's pizza. <laughs> now, if I said my mantra is pizza, and I close my eyes and say, G. Old Shaky's, G. Old Shaky's, I can say all my life. I won't go with them. It's not a good mantra for me. It is taking me outside. It is taking me to the pizza shop. And I can say it as often as I like, it won't take me in. Therefore, a mantra should not be such that has association of ideas with something outside. There's a cleverness in the design of these mantras that these practitioners, the mystic adepts made, that the mantra was such, either it had no association for the person who was repeating, if it did develop an association, it developed association with something that was already within. And therefore, it began to give an impetus to go within because the association of the words, when they meant something, was something within. About the mantra, you recall the story of the American seeker who found out that in the Himalayas, there are some very expert yogis sitting. Some Swami was sitting there meditating for a long time, for centuries. And he had that Swami in the Himalayas at the foothill at the foothills of Tibet, had found a mantra. When you repeat it, you go in instantly. And as you know, American seekers always like instant things, even instant realization. So that seeker traveled all the way to India, to the Himalayas, and went to meet the Swami to find out that great mantra which could take one inside. Eventually, he met the Swami. And he said, Master, I've come from the United States of America a country full of new seekers, but who want quick results, not sitting in meditation for 10 years and 20 years. We want quick results. And I believe you have a mantra that gives quick results. And the master said, yes, I do. 
said, can you share that with me? He said, of course, you have come so far away. I will share that with you. So the disciple crouched close to the master and the Swami with his hand like this whispered the mantra into the ear of the disciple. He said, go to a quiet place and say abracadabra. He said, what? I've come all this way just to say abracadabra? He says, no, there's a condition attached to it. When you say abracadabra, don't think of bananas. That's the secret. The man tried all his life. The moment he would start saying abracadabra, bananas would come before him. The Swami was merely giving him a message. It's not repetition of words. That's not the mantra. The mantra is to be able to say something, to be able to hear something that has no association with anything in the world that you know of. If somebody can hear a sound or a word inside, which has no meaning with anything outside this world, one goes within. Therefore, the power of listening to the mantra and going within rests upon the fact that that sound is not a sound that takes you to the world, but a sound that takes you to the self. It is this secret from which these mystics discovered the power of the sound current within. This was a natural key. Sometimes one has wondered when one has understood that the whole of creation is the work of one creator. You may believe it or not, I do believe that there is only one creator. And that one creator is a conscious being. That a creator that is not conscious cannot create conscious things. An unconscious creator cannot create conscious beings like us. If we exist, must be conscious creators. I believe there is only one creator. If there is one creator, and all the scriptures support that, that there is only one creator. If there is only one creator, and he is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present, omniscient, omnipresent, he cannot possibly be subdivided. If he is not divided, he is not piece by piece in us. The whole of him is in us. Therefore, he must be like a huge one consciousness and this show must be going on within him. I got this little riddle in my head once. Then people told me that going and having God realization is like a drop of the ocean merging with the ocean. That we are like little drops. The ocean is the creator, God. We got separated from the ocean. And these drops are now floating around in all this creation and crying for the Lord and want to go back home and merge with the ocean and become like the ocean. When I first heard this analogy, this particular comparison between a soul and God, that I am like a little drop and the God, the creator, my ultimate sought after deity is the ocean and I have to now somehow go and merge there, it occurred to me that at least I am a drop now. After merger, who will I be? Nobody. I lose everything I have. And God is a huge big ocean. Adding one drop makes no difference to him. Neither God gains nor I gain. What kind of game am I enter entering into? This drop merging with ocean is nobody is a gainer. I lose my identity as a drop. He gains nothing. What are we doing? These must be the games of these priests and these other uh, teachers and yogis who are teaching us to go on this spiritual journey. Ultimately, both of us will gain nothing. I will lose everything. God will gain nothing. What is this game going on? But the error in which I thought like that came to my light as I perceived that if God is omnipresent and omniscient and has all the qualities of God as given in all scriptures everywhere on earth since civilization began, since recorded history of man is known, if he is everywhere, how could he be one drop short? How could he be one soul missing? How could he be billion souls missing? He can't be perfect after that. How could that ocean be total if some drops are floating around somewhere else? It didn't make sense. It meant that God has been chipped off some pieces. That's not possible. It doesn't fit in with any concept of God that we have. Therefore, I had to rework the whole story all over again. The reworked story made much more sense. That God was total ocean. All the drops are still there. They never left. So God was total. Even the souls 
who thought they were separated were actually part of God. And they were in God and God was in them whole without breaking up. So the, when we say a drop, we are not talking of a drop physically separated. So I went to look at the ocean and I stood on the, on the docks and watched the sea. And I said, boy, this big ocean, this big sea here, this Atlantic Ocean, this looks like a vast amount of water. But if I look closely, the water is the same. It's all full of so many drops. Millions and billions of drops I saw all at once, which I had never seen before. I suddenly saw that the whole ocean was nothing but drops. And then I saw how big are the drops. Sometimes I saw very big drops. Sometimes I saw very small drops. Sometimes very tiny drops. And I noticed that what was making the sea into drops was my awareness. What was making the size of the drop small or big was my awareness. The sea remained whole all the time. And suddenly the discovery came to me. We are souls in the same nature in relation to God. That we never left Him. But our awareness got blocked to smallness. And we thought we are separated. And that is why the scriptures rightly said our separation is an illusion. Because in fact, we never left God. What then is this journey from a drop to the ocean? Is a journey of a small part which thinks it is separated and is a drop and is yet all the time part of that ocean. Regaining its awareness to totality and discovering it was the ocean all the time. That made a lot of sense. That answered all the questions. That that is exactly how we are looking at this universe. We are looking at this universe and that consciousness from which we are looking, which has become so shrunk as if it is confined to one physical body, was in fact the same consciousness which has remained total. And when we go within and discover the nature of our consciousness, it expands to its totality and lets us know there was only one consciousness and that was the creator. And that is how the creator is inside of us. That is how the whole of the ocean is inside that drop, which looks like a drop while we are looking at the world outside. So it made great sense for me to understand the relationship between the spiritual seeker and the ultimate creator. The spiritual seeker, by discovering the totality, becomes the totality. So once a person says, is it possible for a human being to see God? In absolute sense, it be, the answer would be no. Because if God were there, there would be no human being outside of that God. And if man is there, there can't be God. Therefore, we are placing this question in two different levels. The level in which man exists, man can only conceive God, have a concept of God. When man rises, when a human being rises to totality, becomes God, there is no man to look at God. It is the same being. God has never been separated physically from a human being. It is an experience of illusion, an experience of a strange drama in consciousness itself. This individuation in consciousness that has created a human being is within that total consciousness and not outside of it. And therefore, all these answers come to us either by theoretical speculation or they come to us by going within and studying the nature of that consciousness. When these mystics say, go within, and find the truth. They are so sure that if you go within to consciousness, you'll get all this knowledge. They don't say, remember to watch out these things. Remember to watch out that thing. They say, go and see. You'll find it there. And that is the truth. Unfortunately, when we say go within, we go into different chakras. We focus our attention on this part or that part. We focus our attention behind the eyes. We focus our attention on what we think is this middle eye. We focus our attention on the heart center, on the Kant uh, chakra, on the neck center, throat center. We concentrate attention on any other part except on who is concentrating the attention. The self is the one that concentrates the attention, that focuses. Not that where the focus is taking place. So we move outside even when we close our eyes and try to go within. If you can understand this secret, that we have to withdraw to who we are, as conscious beings, as beings that are aware, if we can withdraw attention to that part, we find the truth. And not if we 
look at different parts of our body or our self or our nature. That is not our self. Has God, as the owner of this great mansion of total consciousness, dropped himself out through illusion, locked himself out? Sometimes it looks like that. If there is only one God, and that is the only reality, and we are experiencing the same reality, that there is no other conscious being except God. And when we experience consciousness, we are actually sharing in the show of consciousness of that one God, and we are not separate. Then we have been placed in a great disadvantage. Have we been placed in a disadvantage, or he has been placed in a disadvantage? If there is only one creator, and he is the only real thing, has that real creator put himself at a disadvantage by becoming human, seeker, and then ultimately seeking and finding that he was always there? Is that the process? Is that how we are going to go back and discover the truth? That the, that the one God had a beautiful mansion to live in. He decided to lock himself out and then say, how do I go back into my own home? We are trying to go back to our own home. And when we go home, we find that we were the owners of the home anyway. That was our home to start with. Why did we leave the home? And did we leave our, the home in such a way that we can't get back? Did we lock the house and throw the key in so we can't get in? I don't think any clever God would have done that. And surely totality of consciousness, which has produced so many clever individuated consciousnesses here, couldn't have done that. There's no way. Even a few bits of consciousness that you see around in this area tell you that God must be super, super, super intelligent not to make the mistake of locking himself out of total consciousness that we are now supposed to use in order to unlock and go back into totality from the individuated position that we have now taken. As individual souls, we are looking for our destination. What key do we use? If you watch carefully how the mystics and these adepts have explained the structure of this show, the structure of creation, they have said there is one link between not only that final mansion and our present state in the physical world, but a link that opens the doors to every intervening door that may come on the way. There is a master key which opens every door on the way. And that master key is the same as the nature of the ultimate consciousness. But it manifests in a form in which we can experience it. And that master key, it may surprise you to know, can be called a sound, a sound current, something that can be heard, the audible sound current, the word. The ultimate word. The word is the master key. It's not a spoken word. It is not a word of any language. It is not a word that has ever been written. It is not a word that can be written, but it can be heard. It is a resonance, a sound that can be heard but not written. It's extremely difficult to describe it. And that sound is coming from within. From the highest mansion it starts, from totality, travels through every mansion and comes right up to here where we are and can be heard by anybody inside. It rings inside the holy men, it rings inside the gangster, it rings inside the criminals, it rings inside the most pious people, it is there in good people and bad people, it is in every human being who exists anywhere in this universe, that sound is ringing inside behind the eyes. If you hold on to that sound, you can unlock all the doors all the way back to heaven, back to your own original home where you reside as the creator, where you discover your own true nature and your true form. Therefore, this resonance, this sound, this is, sound is of great importance. It is the key. And since it is coming from inside, there is nothing greater as a mantra than that sound. There is no word that you can use as a mantra. The spoken words are a, at best a very small guide, very small source of assistance to go within. But the inner sound 
which resonates in the spirit itself, which comes from consciousness itself, is the greatest mantra that is ever discovered. And that mantra, whoever has heard, has been able to take this journey in what is called the royal style. You can do meditation in the Hatha Yoga style. You can stand on live coals, burn your souls, and you can stand in the water in the river with one leg up for long periods. You can stand with your head down and your feet up. You can do a lot of rough yoga. Or you can do the yoga in the royal style, like a king, sitting like a king in great calmness, in great beauty of understanding the nature of this creation and the nature of the creator, closing the eyes, listening to the sound current within, and riding upon the waves of that sound and going back home. That's the royal style of yoga. This yoga has sometimes been referred to as the Surta Shabd Yoga. Surt means attention. The human attention. Shabd means the sound. Yoga means union. The union that can be achieved through the attention being placed upon the sound of the self. And that's the royal yoga. Very few people knew about it. A lot of people who have tried different kinds of yoga, of energies and experiences, some just wanted to have a kick. I don't know what, is that correct American phrase? Just for a ride, for a kick. And they didn't care whether they got themselves or found self or truth or anything. They did various kinds of yoga. But those who wanted to find the truth within, they found that the ultimate truth can be found by linking oneself with the sound current within. I should say a few words more about the sound current before we get on to the practice of going within through the sound current. The sound current is not a sound, yet behaves like a sound. It, it's very, there is some, when I try to say this, you notice there's a hesitation. I normally not a hesitant person. <laughs> but in this case, when I try to describe the sound current, I become hesitant like the little child who was uh, telling her mom, mom, there's a boy. And the mom said, no child, that's not a boy, that's a bird. No, mom, there's a boy. That's no boy, that's a bird. But mom, that chops like a boy. <laughs> I am caught in that state. That there is no real word. I am mispronouncing the word to describe the sound current. The sound current let me go further and you, I'll make myself clear. The sound current is a personality. Can you think of a sound which is also a personality? The sound current is conscious. The sound current is the master. The sound current is the only true master. The sound current is the self. The sound current is the super self. The sound current is the creator. Nothing exists here except with the resonance and the vibration of the sound current. How can I describe it as something that we just play a piano or a, or a toll a bell and say we found the sound current? Yet it can be heard. That is the contradiction that this sound current which represents the real truth and it is the sound current that gives us the feeling of being a self. It's a very important point. What makes us feel we are the self? Have you ever noticed that? People say, oh, I, I myself can do it. Who is myself? I myself can do it. When we say this, I myself. What identifies the self? Separate from everything else. I myself can do it apparently refers to the form in which consciousness is operating at that time. For example, this body in which the self is hidden at this time, apparently, when I want to walk by myself without anybody's help, I say, I myself can walk. Referring to the body's ability to walk, guided by that consciousness inside. That becomes the self. Consciousness with the body becomes the self. But what happens if the body goes to sleep at night and I have a dream? In the dream, I am not a body, I am a butterfly. They fly all over the flowers and after flying and come back. Like Jing Fang, the Chinese philosopher. Jing Fang 
he flew all over as a butterfly in a dream and enjoyed the ride a lot because the flowers were so pretty. But when he got up in the morning and he saw that he was a butterfly in the dream, a thought came to him. He was a philosopher. A thought came to him. Am I really Jing Tang who dreamt he was a butterfly and who dreamt that he was flying all over the flowers? Or am I a butterfly who is now dreaming that I am Jing Tang, the philosopher, contemplating this question? Is there a way to find an answer? He got caught on that. But the point I was making is he was sure that the self who flew as a butterfly was the same self who got up as Jing Tang and put the question. The two totally different forms, totally different experiences, the self was continuously the same. Because the experience of flying around the flowers took place around that butterfly in which the consciousness was trapped. And the process of waking up and asking questions about the dream were taking place in a human body in which the same consciousness was trapped. And the same consciousness could say, I was that butterfly, not that I saw a butterfly. This propagation of the self as a continuous entity is created by the sound current. If there was no sound current, we could dream of a, fly, of a butterfly and say, I saw a butterfly. We wouldn't say, I was a butterfly. The fact that I, the self, goes into the butterfly as easily and identifies with it as it comes into this form. If this form became a cloud in one of the meditational exercises and the cloud floated away just like a puff of white cloud with no eyes, no body, the self would still say, I am now a cloud. With what evidence? There is no similarity between the butterfly of the dream, the body of the physical world, and a cloud of the heavens. How does the self remain the same? Who can say, I am now a cloud? Who is saying that? That individualized consciousness that can claim to be the same and creates a link in experience is the sound current. So the sound current is not merely a conscious being. It is a continuity of experience. You will be amazed this continuity of the experience of the self has never been broken and will never be broken in future. Here we have so many people sitting here in this hall and we can say God is in all of us. And God is the true self. Which one is the true self? Is it Jeff's or is it Georgine's, Dwight's, Clarence? There's so many people sitting here. Whose self is the total God or everybody? Or is there a separate self in each of us? You will notice to your great amazement if you look around that there's only one self looking around. You can all look around and you'll find there's only one self looking around. Can you experience two selves looking around? Can you experience individually? No, it's not possible. It has never happened. It has never happened in creation that the self split itself into two. It got the experience of split. That means at one point it experienced the self and at the other time it became what looked like the self but was an experience of that self. Like if you go to sleep and have a dream and see ten people in the dream, they are not ten, ten dreamers. There is only one dreamer. Only one person is dreaming and all those tens are part of the dream. You cannot say they are the dreamers. Though they look like the dreamer, they act like the dreamer, they talk like the dreamer, they do everything like the dreamer, yet they are part of a dream of one dreamer. Such is this creation. There is only one self. This workshop is taking place for one self and is being created by one self and that self is the one you are experiencing. And there is no other self. All the other selves appear to have come and are being projected by the same self. But where is that self? Can I pinpoint it? No. Each of you know where it is. It is within your own self. When will you find out that this self, which created such an illusion of real people around me, such an illusion of real life around me, when will I find out that actually this was the only reality? When you wake up, when you see 10 people in a dream and you are not sure who is who and who is real, you wake up and you find that you are the dreamer. If you know that you are the dreamer, you have no doubt that the only person in that dream out of those 10 people who could have woken up 
and could have said it was a dream was one person and that was yourself in the dream. You could not say maybe that other person will wake up and find this was a dream. Only the self can wake up to awaken, awaken state and know it was a dream. Such is the state here also. When we awaken to a higher level of consciousness within ourselves, we discover how the lower level was created as a dream. This wakeful state is only one level of experience, one level of consciousness, and therefore one level of the projection of a pattern from the self. All levels are like that. Therefore, all levels, including the highest level of totality of consciousness, when it creates a heaven, the created heaven is part of the self. And is not real. Only the self is real. Consciousness as the single self is the only reality. But here is a wonderful key that we as totality threw out and kept with us and did not lock inside the house, which we can use to open all the doors stage by stage. And eventually, when we reach our own true heavenly home, we find it was our home all the time all the time. That there was only one consciousness. The rest was like a dream. Some good dreams, some bad dreams. At the lowest level, a lot of bad dreams. But they were all dreams of the same consciousness. This is the creative power of the sound current to create level after level. I don't know. Some little children sometimes are very intuitive. I have come across a few who can listen to creation. Very few. And I sometimes marvel if, if the Shabad, this power, the sound current is flowing so strongly in them, so audibly in them that they can see. If you uh, remember recently they conducted an experiment in silence, that if there was no sound in this world, what would you do? They proved that a human being is listening all the time. A deaf person is listening. The human being listening, you can see from the tympanic movements and the brain uh, or the auditory, what are they called, the nervous systems, that you are listening all the time to something. There is no time when you are not listening. They say if the usual coarse sounds of this world, like sounds, birds and bees and uh, machines and uh, air conditioner and uh, water and heartbeats, if all these sounds were excluded, a man would turn crazy in five minutes. Actually, they experimented in a, in a box where the man could not hear any sound except his own heartbeat, which became very loud. Actually, the heart was still at the same pace. But the listening device had been trapped inside, in, inside the small sound and they found that the man couldn't bear it. Do you know we are unable to bear silence? We have never been in a total silence, in a state of silence. I am bringing this up from another point of view, that actually if you analyze experience, you will find experience consists of sound. I will go further and explain another point of view. Experience has been artificially subdivided into sensory perception. We can see a thing, we can hear a thing, we can touch, taste and smell. Actually all these are subdivisions of listening. And how is that? Watch carefully your day-to-day -day life. I am told I shouldn't use this paper too much. Yesterday in the lecture, people got attention got diverted to the paper and not to my lecture. If we watch and I say, look at this paper, you open your eyes and look at it. If you just look with the eyes at the paper, you know, don't see the paper. Then you comment upon this. There is a paper and you see it. Did you know that? Did you know that? That unless you listen to your mind telling you what you are seeing, you cannot see. Unless you listen to your mind telling you what you are hearing, you can't hear. Unless your mind tells you what you are touching, you cannot touch. The sensory perceptions are interpreted. What they call the interpretive, uh, interpretative function of the mind is to tell you what you are doing. That till it tells you, you are doing nothing. That sensory perceptions can be totally blacked out if the mind refuses to interpret. That the people who are in a state of daze and see nothing are actually not in a state of daze. They are walking, their eyes are open, 
things are seeing and the images are falling on the retina and the retina is carrying the images to the brain to the right right spots in the brain but they are seeing nothing because the brain in the speaking form of a mind is refusing to interpret what they are seeing therefore they don't see all seeing is listening to what you are seeing all hearing is listening to what you are hearing all touching is listening to what you are touching all sensory experience is eventually listening to what you are doing without that listening no experience becomes alive we fail to recognize this because we do not know the conscious process inside us that the consciousness creates experience through the listening device all the time therefore the sound current is the only creative power the sound current <clears throat> is being placed in a uh, in an externalized version that i am giving you i am giving you the sound current as a sound that comes from somewhere and we listen i am making it easy to understand i am being simplistic about the sound current by saying the sound current is that which you can listen because it is coming that's not the correct way of saying it the correct way of saying it is there is a sound current being created by your listening listening supersedes the sound if your listener is not there there is no sound it's not that the sound is there and then you get into the middle and start listening listening makes the sound and listening is being made by the sound current sound current is the listener when it listens it becomes the sound sound current is the creative power that gives all experiences when we say creative power we are talking of creation of an experience and the experience when it looks real looks like real material creation all creation is taking place from this principle of the sound current being the listener and it listen to itself and therefore it becomes the sound listening by itself is the sound current listening through a conscious being that is the sound and is the listener makes it the sound current and what it listens to becomes creation we we uh, invented this word consciousness and found it very useful in our discussions in philosophy we need not have invented it we could have used some other word we could, we were quite happy at one time with god and this creation there was no consciousness about it this is a modern word we may devise another modern word tomorrow the truth is these words are all falling short of what we are trying to say consciousness assumes that this is a characteristic of god and we then sit and say one day god was sitting somewhere with nothing no creation do you know the moment you say that by definition you have blocked out god you blank them out you have you finished him you killed him by saying god was sitting with doing nothing and yet he was conscious kills him he cannot be conscious we have nothing to be conscious of the same thing you do if you say he is a creator if his only job is creation and he is a creator and there is no creation he ceases to be a creator therefore these words which we are using from time to time to describe the absolute state they all fall short of the actual nature of the absolute state but we use them to the best of our judgment as it suits us at this level of understanding as the understanding grows we will see the weaknesses of all these words that is why i am so i am so hesitant when i use these words and i realize how imperfectly i am using all these words and i do not know any perfect words to describe the sound current the creative power of the sound current means that consciousness in its highest form can be conscious and therefore we call it consciousness and whatever it can be consciousness is creation that creation is what consciousness is conscious of and to be conscious of something is creation therefore the listening of the sound current sets a pattern of experiences that sets this whole world in motion if you go deep into it stage by stage you will find out how exactly we are having this pattern which we are thinking is our karma and our life and destiny here our so called individual life and destiny in this world is patterned perfectly according to this delegation of consciousness from stage to stage and level to level of the experience of consciousness to go back stage by stage from where we are now we use the same royal style of yoga the path of the sound current we go within and listen to it 
Is there anybody here who has ever heard the sound currents within? Because when you're quiet, you are hearing the sound. Thank you. I presume the others haven't heard it. If you sit quiet, you will hear a sound. It is like white sound. You know white sound? Have you heard of the expression white sound? White sound is a sound that they create, which is physical sound that you don't hear. They create it so that you don't hear it. Did you know that they create sound that you don't hear? In uh, Canada, uh, there is a town, a city, uh, city hall, city hall building, town hall building uh, near Toronto that was designed by a Japanese architect and he made very good use of white sound in there. There are waterfalls, the drums rolling in the basement and he has created and merged so many sounds that uh, they mingle with each other and create a uniform effect of an endless sound. And that effect, when you enter from outside the street, you may feel for a little while that the fountains are on, but after a few minutes, you are not aware of any sound. But what is the advantage that uh, in a hollow room with no sound proofing, you could uh, hear even a whisper in that kind of a building that he has made, a building with no full walls. Every room is a half wall. This is a new style of uh, design that he made that you should never have. He thought that when you make full walls, people don't attend to their work. They want to know what is happening on the other side. And when you have a half wall which goes three four, then people have a tendency to listen to gossip. So he made short walls. He said, Let people see. Then he made short walls. The Japanese architect he found nobody is interested in anybody else. That the secret of creating gossip is to make it secret. And when you uh, one lady told another that, look, you never told me about this yesterday. He said, I didn't know it was a secret. That means had she known it was a secret, she would have immediately relate to everybody else. <laughs> that architect puts white sound in a big way in that building. And the white sound makes one 10,000 typewriters are working at the same time in that building. And nobody is interfered with the sound of a typewriter. They're drowned in the sound of that. So they have created a sound which is constantly there but is not heard. This sound current of the self is so loud. Sometimes I wonder, can't you hear it? Sometimes I want to shout like this. Can't you hear it? Don't you see it going on so loud right now? It has never stopped. But then I realize if people don't hear that white sound, how can you blame them for not hearing this while it is actually going on in each one of us right now? And all you have to do is to pay a little attention. Pay attention to the self and you will hear it. It is not a sound that some, some Swami or Yogi will come and put into you. The sound is already there. It is not that somebody will have to invent a special apparatus for it. God invented it already by giving us a human body and a human consciousness and a free will. When you have these qualifications, the sound is all automatically there. This sound that reverberates in the center of our being, in the center of our self, is the one, if you can listen to that, there is nothing that will draw your attention, withdraw your attention to your own self faster. And there is no other yoga known that will draw it faster. And this is the secret, the royal style of yoga that can give you a knowledge of your own self. Very few perfect mystics have come and shared this knowledge with us. There have been many yogis, yogeshwars, and many murshids and many masters in every culture who have taught us various things. But rarely you will come across 